chapter 1, and I'm just going to start reading from the first verse, and it says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 <laughs> Praise the Lord, church. repeat it all the time, but every praise.
with Simon. We are so grateful and we are going to pray for you. And we are going to be so excited about it. So who's going to be the first one? I. Okay. Oh. Oh. All right. Anyway, in one accord. In one accord. I'm just happy that my children came to Bible.
you guys for waking me up this morning. Pastor A, you want to say something? No, no. no I, you want to say something? I, 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 I want to say thank you, God, because I was so sure the thing you were going to say is thank you, God, that I didn't go to work today. Because you oh, got yes. a holiday. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I thank God because I, I feel good to be, you know, free to be in the meeting that we had. I love you all. Yeah. I thank the Lord because I, I really realized that it's quality. God has put such high quality people. And what I mean by quality is not, it's people that love the Lord. Mm -hmm. And when the teaching was about character, I, I feel really honored to be around people that have character. And I can, I can tell it's people with character. And I want you to know that I am honored to be a part of the leadership team with you. It's an honor to be in the house of the Lord. Every time I wake up, I say, thank you, Jesus, for another day. Thank you, God, because I'm a good so his name is Abraham, and he's worthy to all of bread. I have a song. I don't want to cry. I'm a cry baby. I'm so emotional that I'm. That's it's worship. You don't apologize for it. It's worship. <laughs> I think this is, um, this is a song that I have it in, in, in my heart. Always. They said if you search all over, yeah. Yeah. you can't find yeah. nothing. Yeah. Compared to that. Yeah. Yeah. So I know Pastor Chase has also Let's go sing this song. Worship him with this song.
Um, I just been all, all like, anybody ever get in a place in time where you just can't stay out of the word? Yes. I just been in one of the places, you know, where it's, if I'm not reading it, I'm listening to it. My headphones in my ear, you know, just like tuned to it. And the, I'm going to get to the um, part two of Sunday. Um, Y'all remember that one? Yes. We don't need you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to get on that one. But um, I was in, as Sister Leah said, I was in John 5. John chapter 5. And I was looking at um, the thought of no more lame excuses. I guess somebody needs to say, no more lame excuses. No more lame excuses. We make so many excuses um, why we aren't reaching our highest potential. And um, my mother would always say it like this, um, whatever you love to do, you'll find time to do. Um, my husband, well, Chris says this all the time, too, about excuses. Excuses are tools of incompetence. Yeah. Um, so before you make another excuse, think about that. That, that, is, a, that is a tool of incompetence. And um, the truth be told, God has placed everything on the inside of you to be able to fulfill the assignment that you have. So um, stop it with the lame excuses. Um, lame excuses and the things that we say that we can't do when the scripture tells us in Philippians that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so we say, um, we make our excuses why we aren't ready and why we, um, God should pick somebody else. I know I'm talking to the right people tonight. <laughs> Um, that, you know, that God, no, you ain't talking to me, talk to them, that I have other things to do, and why we can't be all that God has called us to be. We make excuses, and excuses stand in the way of us reaching our destiny. And so in John chapter 5, it talks about this man who the Bible doesn't even give him a name. It just says he's lame. Mm -hmm. right, right. And you know you are messed up mm -hmm. when you begin to be described by your issue yes. and mm -hmm. not your name. Mm -hmm. You know you are in bad shape when people refer to you as crackhead yes. instead of by the name that your mother gave you. Yes. You know you are jacked up when people start referring to you as the liar. Um, and you become known by your issue. Yes. And so I would submit to you tonight, be honest with yourself, what do people know you as? Mm -hmm. on, the, on, on, on the job, are you the one that zaps out on everybody? Hot-tempered person, do they know you by that? What are you known by? Mm -hmm. Bible tells us that we ought to be called the children of God. Yes. It says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. And so there's some names I don't mind you calling me, but one of them is not lame. Yeah. And so if I don't want people to call me lame, then I need to start, stop acting lame. Mm -hmm. And I need to stop making excuses. Yeah. And, and so the reason that this man was at this pool, it says in um, John chapter 5, after this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew Bethesda, which has five porches. And in these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. It, 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 it's interesting that everybody there is messed up. And if you're not careful, you will surround yourself along with your excuses around a whole bunch of other people who are messed up. And that's why it's important for you to always take an inventory on the company that you're keeping. Are, are the people who you're hanging out with, are they getting closer to God or are they drawing further away from God? 
And so it, 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 it's no accident that it points out the kind of people who are assembled there. And we are um, known by our associations. Yeah. Yeah. We, we are guilty by our as associations, amen. And so, uh, you know, there, there's a problem if everybody around you is lame and you have not come to the realization that you are lame too. The truth of the matter is all of us have issues. And we're not going to ever be able to get healed and delivered from our issues if we don't admit that we have them. Yeah. You can't conquer what you don't confront. And so every day, every time the word of the Lord goes forth, every time you enter into the presence of the Lord, it's an opportunity for you to conquer. But you got to confront first. You've got to be honest with yourself. How many of us are honest with ourselves? And so the Bible says... One man talks about this lame man. He was there for 38 years. Look at somebody say, that's a long time. That's a long time to be dealing with the same issue. But if you're not careful, you will look and you will see that you're dealing with the same issue year after year, week after week. And you will get comfortable in it. And so Jesus saw him lying there. And he knew that he had been there a long time. And the Bible says, he says to him, sir, do you even want to be well? He says, do you even want to be well? Some people like being sick because they get attention when they're sick. Some people like having issues because that is their form of being able to work on the, and pull the heartstrings of other people and manipulate other people. I know I'm teaching right in here tonight. Uh, and, and so some people are so bound and rejected that they have not come to the point to understand that they need to be delivered and set free. Amen. Come on, the Bible says he who the Son sets free is free indeed. And so it would be a shame for you to come to church week after week and still be bound. Jesus is right here in front of this man. He's right there. Come on, how many times Jesus, we have felt his presence. We knew that he was right there with us. He said he promised he'd never leave us or forsake us, so he's always with us. He said, even if you make your bed in hell, I'll be there with you. And so Jesus is always with us. And so here's this lame man making excuses for 38 years, and Jesus is right there in front of him. And he still is lame. Still making excuses. Come on, that's what we do. We come to church. The presence of the Lord is high. People are getting healed. People are being filled with the Holy Ghost. People are being delivered. And we sit there in the presence of Jesus. And we don't get up out of, out of our funk. We don't get up out of that place of complacency that we're in. And so Jesus says to him, Jesus asked him, what I would consider to be a rhetorical question because Jesus doesn't have to ask any of us any questions because he knows everything anyway. Yes, that's it. That's it. And so Jesus walks up to him and he says to him, sir, do you even want to be well? And the reason that he asked him this question is because everything about his behavior, everything about his lifestyle says that he doesn't want to be well. And we got to be careful we come into the house of the Lord and we go through the motions, but yet we don't show in our behavior that we want anything different than what we have continued to have. Yes. Jesus says, do you want to be well? Ask somebody, do you want to be well? Want to be well. And so the story goes on and, you know, the guy starts making excuses. The guy starts making a whole bunch of excuses. But ultimately, the reason for many of us why we don't get delivered and why we stay in a place where we continue to make excuses is because we are scared. And we allow our fears to drive us. Many of you, you know the hand of God is on your life. You know you're anointed. You know you're called. You know God has greatness for you. But you're afraid. What are you afraid of? Because whatever you're afraid of is the reason why you're making excuses. And 2 Timothy chapter 1 and 7 tells me that God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. 
And so I have the power to overcome my fears. I have the power, come on, I'm talking to somebody, I have the power to overcome my fears because the scripture tells me that greater is he that is within me than he that is within the world. Is the greater one on the inside of you? That if the greater one is on the inside of you, you have no excuse because you got power. You, you can't have a sound mind and allow fear to rule you because fear is irrational. Come on, think about how many times you have stressed yourself out about something bad happening and it never happens. See, that's what fear does. Fear is irrational. Come on, fear, fear is a spirit and we have the power to cast down every imagination or high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of Christ. In other words, you have the power to put it in its place. Come on, you know how to put people in their place. You gotta learn to put the devil in his place. And to tell him that he cannot run the show in your life. But fear is often the motivating factor for many Christians. Afraid. Afraid to do what God tells us to do when we know what the word says. And so many of us have our fears attached to people. And the reason we have our fears attached to people is because we've been hurt by people. And so now we don't want to trust anymore. And so we attach fear to people because we place expectations on people that people never met for us. And many of us are just disappointed because we place people in positions we should have never placed them in in the first place and they let us down and then we find ourselves with a spirit of rejection and we're an emotional wreck, amen. And some of us might not even be mentally in a place and emotionally stable enough to minister to anybody else because we have not gotten free from a spirit of fear that has controlled us. See, God wants to use you, but he can only do but so much while you're hanging on to lameness. <laughs> and so, if fear is the reason that you're making lame excuses, stop it. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and a sound mind. Come on, look at somebody and say, you have a sound mind. You have a sound mind. It is not rational for a child of God to operate out of a spirit of fear. I, I, I remember for me, the hardest thing, and that, that's what held me from being able, for, for years, to be able to get my degree, is because I was afraid of these math classes because I've never been good at math. And so I take everything else and leave that alone. And the only reason I left it alone is because I had a bad experience before. And I said, I'm not good at this. As, as a child in middle school, my parents put me in Sylvan Learning Center so I could figure out my problems with math. They took me all the way back to see where the disconnect was. They said, it's algebra. And I said, okay, yeah, they figured out what the problem is, but I still don't understand it. <laughs> and so it held me bound for so long until I got mad at the devil and I said, you are not going to control me. To the point I ended up doing better in my math class than I did in my English class, which I was always excellent at. <laughs> but you got to get to a place where you stop playing around with fear because fear will play mind games on you it will tell you you can't be what it is that you know God called you to be if you listen to it you know how you hang up on those bill collectors hang up on fear <laughs> so that takes us fast forward or rewind back to Sunday. Gideon. Y'all remember when we talked about Gideon. Gideon has 32,000 men to Midian's how many men? 135,000 135, men. And so this 
looks impossible. I'm talking to somebody who right now you're dealing with some situations and it looks impossible. I don't know how I'm going to do this. This is too big for me. God, you see what I'm dealing with. Some of us, when we get to paying our bills, we look at it and it looks like 135000 against 32000 We say, God, I don't know how I'm going to make it. And it looks like it can't be done, but the Bible that I read says, with God, all things are possible. Come on, I'm trying to breathe life into somebody in here tonight that you, are, you have let fear run your show all week long. And tonight is the night to evict fear out of your heart, out of your mind, out of your life. Come on, you got to get it up out of every crevice of your house, anything that resembles it, any person that resembles it. Any soul tie that you have, you have got to say goodbye. You cannot live here anymore with, with Mickey Howard saying, I'm in love under new management. <laughs> Come on, you, 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 you got to declare these things. Like under new management, uh -uh, oh, that old management is gone. We're not running things like that no more. Come on, somebody ought to tell the devil, we're not running things like that no more. Come on, and, and, and fear has such a way of working you up where you're, you know, you're sweating. You, you can't sleep, you can't eat, you're snapping at people. Come on, you're short-tempered and irritated. Come on, you, you're all stressed out. You're no fun to be around. Come on, ain't nothing worse than being around somebody that's scared all day long. You run and tell the kid, kid, don't answer the phone. Don't answer the door. Come on, eat. we can't do nothing. And the, the whole spirit of the house has changed because you're letting fear run the show. Fear ain't even paying rent. Ain't paying no utility bills. But you letting it run the show. And so Gideon... He's in a place where, you know, Gideon has already um, proven to be a scaredy cat. You know, he, we talked about the Sunday. He was, the Midianites, they were these people that were coming and ridiculing the people of God every year. Every year, harvest time. The people of God are working, working, gathering stuff up. And here comes the enemy, right? comes in and just takes it. And so Gideon said, I'm going to do this different because I don't want the enemy to take my stuff. So Gideon goes and he begins to thresh wheat in a wine press. And so fear has been his motivating factor, but he's getting by with his fear tactics. And if you aren't careful, you will think you can get by being fearful. You, you'll think that God is, 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 is approving of your hiding. But God was just, okay, I see how you're doing things, but that still doesn't remove the fact that I have my hand on your life. <laughs> Come on, I'm talking to somebody here. You can be afraid, but do it afraid. Yes. Come on, whatever it is, do it afraid. Yes. But don't stop doing what it is that God called you to do. Come on, shaking and all, stuttering and all, just do it, amen. Come on, get up and do it. And so Gideon, he's now this, you know, personality that everybody's hearing about. You know, when God starts using you, people start hearing about you. When God starts using you, people are like, what's up? Oh, wow. Yeah, I heard about you. <laughs> you know, God, God, he said, I'll make your name great. That's what God will do. God will raise you up and God will bring you before great men. God will put you in that kind of situation. And so God knew that with Gideon's 32,000 and the Midianites 135,000, God knew that even though the odds looked stacked against Gideon, that he needed to show Gideon that his fear cannot run the show. And so God starts doing some elimination. God, God starts removing some people 
in Gideon's army. Gideon's like, wait a minute, I only have this many, God, and you're telling me in Judges 7, you're telling me that I have too many? God, God comes and tells him this. God says, you still, you have too many men. And so, you know, in a matter of one day, God says, get rid of all the fearful people. <laughs> all, all the fearful ones got to go. Um, verse 3, 7 and 3. Anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. A thousand men left. And only 10,000 remained. Verse 4, but the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. God, you got to be kidding. God, God you got to be kidding. You know, when, when, we, when we start seeing God remove people from our life, we're like, wait a minute, okay, I can deal with that one leaving, but God, that one too? And God's like, yep, there's still too many. And sometimes God will eliminate people in our life simply for the same reason that he did with Gideon is because he said that if you win the battle with these people, these people are going to try to take the credit for the victory. And y'all know about people like that. You know, people in your life who they help you do a couple things and then they don't, they, don't, they, they, won't, they won't let you forget. I got you there. I did that for you. If I, if I didn't tell them about you, you wouldn't be where you were. If I didn't give you that money, you would have went under, underground. If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have the job that you have. And so God didn't want those people to have that kind of power over Gideon. And he also didn't want them to take away his glory. And so he says, there's still too many men, verse 4. He says, take them down to the water. And I'll sift them for you there. And if I say this one shall go with you, that's the one that's going to go with you. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go with you. Isn't it interesting when God starts telling you that person can't go with you? <laughs> that, there's some people that you've been trying to hold on to and God keeps saying, nope, that one can't go with you. And oftentimes when we deal with the dynamics of relationships and we don't understand even why some people won't treat us right. Anybody ever question why people don't treat us right? It's because God is trying to eliminate some people from your life. Why, why some people uh, won't love you for who you are. God is trying to do some elimination. Why some people act like a donkey. God is trying to eliminate some people up out of your life. And many of us, we like to hold on to people and try to fix them. Come on, Iyama, fix my life. Come on, we, we like to try to fix people. And we like to play Holy Ghost Junior, Jesus Junior, and we try to fix people and we try to rehabilitate demons and we try to fix people who don't have our good interest in the first place when God is saying, you know, I'm trying to do some elimination here. And so for some of us, we need to understand that no amount of being nice or begging people to be with us is going to work. If the Lord said this one is going with you, that one's going to go with you. Come on, if the Lord said that one's not going to go with you, then that one's not going to go with you. <laughs> come on, I, I just come to the conclusion that playing dumb and pretending not to know that a person is off when they are off and giving in to people and trying to let them have their way. I'm teaching right <laughs> for the sake of staying and playing around with folk who want to play mind games is for the birds. And the inevitable is going to happen. But I don't care how nice you are to them. I don't care how sweet you are to people. Come on, if a person is going to be a Judas, they're going to be a Judas. Come on, what Jesus said, kiss me and get it over with. Come on, there's some people you need to look at just like Jesus said, kiss me and get it over with. Verse 5, so Gideon took the men down to the water. Took them down to the water. The water, that, that's cleansing. <laughs> took, took them down to that part of purifying. 
And there the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. And I was like, you know, I've been hearing this story my whole life, but God, I was like, God, you're going to have to explain this to me. You have to give me some revelation on this one because I don't really get it. Anybody else think that when you saw that? No, I don't really get it. It said, 300 men lapped with their hands to their mouths and all the rest got down on their knees to drink. And here's, here's the revelation that God gave me. That in order to go to battle against the enemy, you've got to have some people who can multitask. You, you, you got to have some people that can do more than one thing at one time. You got you got to be able to work your job and still work the ministry. Come on, you you got to be able to deal with your issues and still deal with the issues of the people who God has placed in front of you. You got to be able to multitask. This, this, this whole I, I, I'm just too stressed out thing ain't gonna work. I got excited when he gave me that one. <laughs> He's like, you need some people who can do more than one thing at a time because I need people who can take care of themselves and still take care of my stuff. Yes. Come on, I need people who can take care of themselves. You not falling apart every other day. You not having emotional, nervous breakdowns every single day and talking about you gonna win an army. Come on, I, I need some people that can handle their own emotions. They not zapping out and breaking down and having issues every time you turn around because we got a battle to fight and I need some people that can do more than focus on themselves. He said, because, see, the men on their knees, so, so they're on their knees with their face to the water. What, what happens when you get on your knees and look in the water? You see your reflection. These people are so focused on themselves. They're on their knees, face to the water, getting what they need for themselves. And what, what's going on behind you when you're in that kind of position? See, this, this, this speaks to the position that you are in, your mental position. Your mental position has got to be one that you can do more than just look out for yourself. And I would submit that we have too many people in the body of Christ, even people who call themselves mature leaders, who are only concerned about themselves and their own interests and how they look and how things are going for them that they can't minister to nobody else. Come on, that's why we're missing out on the harvest that's out there is because we're focused we got to come out of ourselves. we got to come out of a place of selfishness. When was the last time you put somebody in your car and brought them to church? Quiet. Because, see, we can't multitask. We can barely get ourselves to church. If it requires us getting up an hour early, oh my goodness, an hour early? We like this. I'm just trying to get to church before the donuts are gone. I can't bring nobody to church because I don't have no influence over nobody. And the reason I don't have no influence over nobody is because I ain't concerned about nobody. So don't call me because I ain't going to answer your call. I'm unreachable. But I'm saved. I'm ready for the battle. Come on, look at somebody say there's a war going on. And we are focused on our own reflection. We focus on our own needs. I'm thirsty. Come on, give me the word, Pastor Sherry. Let me even take these notes. So I can get fat on the word. Children unsaved. Family members unsaved. You know, people are dying every day. All we concerned about 
I'm singing Sunday. I'm preaching. I'm teaching. I'm doing what I do. See, what's the key word? I. I. So Jesus, not Jesus, the Lord said, he said, T tell all of them to go home. See, the, the fearful ones were funny. When it went down, to, to, <laughs> he, they just all rolled out. And he said, anybody scared, go home. They're like, oh, I'm about here. But see, I can respect them because at least they said what they were. The problem for many of us is we're in denial or we're either cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. We don't know what it is, but we don't, we don't stand for nothing. And if you don't stand for something, you fall for anything. And so we don't even know where we stand in the situation. The lame man in John 5, at least we knew what he was. See, I, I, I'm, I'm confused about people in church because I don't know what you are. So he said, I, I'm going you know, I'm, I'm to I'm do the separating here. He said, 300. 300 of them who were able to get what they needed, but still be in a position to fight. <laughs> he said, so the other ones can go at home. And he said to Gideon in verse seven, he said, with the 300 men that I lacked, no, 300 men that lacked, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go. Look at somebody say, let all the other men go. Come on, look at somebody else and say, we don't need you. <laughs> Come on, let all the other men go. Amen. Each to his own place. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites to their tents, but kept the 300. Look at somebody say, I'm part of the 300. Come on, I, I, I can get some stuff done, amen. Come on, I, I can deal with my issues, amen, because they're covered by the blood of Jesus. Come on, I, I can deal with my stuff because the word tells me to take it to the altar and leave it there, amen. So I ain't carrying a whole bunch of baggage, amen. I'm able to take care of my needs, but at the same time, I'm taking care of the needs of the house of the Lord and the people of God because I understand that let all the rest of them go. So Gideon sent them home. He sent the rest of them home, but he kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. See, there's a reward. Come on, there's a reward when you have the right motives. Come on, there's a reward because in, that, in a matter of that day, they, they got the spoils of the ones who left. Come on, they, they got with the other ones who disqualified themselves. They were able to take that. So they took over the provisions and trumpets of the other ones. Look at somebody say, they're going to get mad when you stop, when, they, when God stop blessing you with more. Come on, they, other people going to get mad when God start doing great things in your life. But it's just because I've learned to master serving the Lord and taking care of my stuff at the same time. Now the camp of Midian laid below him in the valley. And so it's an interesting, interesting story. When, when, when you get a chance, like really, really like sit down and like read this story. Because it's an amazing story. It's an encouraging story. Because it starts off at the top talking about um, Gideon's fear. Back to that fear thing again. He was fearful and the Lord said a word to him, and I'm going to say that same word to you tonight. He said, you are a mighty man of valor. He said, the Lord is with you. Come on, somebody will look at somebody near them tonight. The Lord is with you. But see, if you really believe that the Lord was with you, you would be sitting there looking all cool like that. Come on, if you really believe that the Lord was with you, you wouldn't be cool Joe right now. You, you would be like, hallelujah. Yes, the Lord is with me. You would realize that you have everything on the inside of you to deal with whatever it is that's in front of you if you really believe that the Lord is with you. Come on, if the Lord is with you, what could you accomplish if you really tap into the reality that the Lord is with you? What can this church actually do if the people in it really got a hold of the fact that the Lord is with us? Yes. Yes. Come on, what 
would happen to your marriage if you realize that the Lord is with you? Come on, what would happen? Your children will go from average students to above average students if you really got it in your heart and mind and in your house that the Lord is with us. See, see, we don't take no B's and C's in our house. We don't, we, that, that's just not, that's not how we roll, is it? We don't roll like that. And so again, that means that we have to take our expectation higher. Come on, we got to take our level of thinking. Our mindset has got to go to another. I'm not expecting to get no phone calls from school. Ain't never got them, ain't never going to get them. I'm, I'm, I'm expecting my husband to come home every day. <laughs> See, it, it, there's some things that you just cannot allow the spirit of fear and intimidation. Come on, the spirit of that, that poverty mindset, that low expectation, that lame mindset. You can just... We were talking the other day, we were talking about um, relationships, and I, I said to him, oh, no, we were talking about men not making commitments to women. We were having a nice conversation. And he said, yeah, I, I don't understand it. He said, I guess, you know, some men just aren't ready to make that commitment. And I said, well, I'd be the last person, and you know that, to be sitting around waiting for you to ask me to marry you. I'd be married today to somebody else. He said, yeah, I know you would. That's just the expectation. The expectation, I always had the expectation. I wasn't going to be nobody's girlfriend for the rest of my life. Amen. Come on. Come on, look at somebody say lame thinking. Lame thinking. lame thinking. Come on, the world system. Don't let the God of this world blind you into yeah. thinking that that is the only person in the world. And I'm not telling you to go give nobody no dear John letter or break up with nobody, but I'm just telling you to raise your expectation. Raise your expectation. Raise your expectation. I, see, I already know Drew going to be rich. I already know it. Like, I know, like, Chris is doing amazing. But Drew got expensive taste. So I already said a long time ago, I mean, I'm talking about since he's like nine years old, he ordered like $18 meals when we go out. I'll take some. I'm like, this boy gonna be rich, you know? <laughs> That's just his mindset. You know, Drew, I will go get a pair of jeans from all, um, not, not only, American Eagle. I'll go get a pair of jeans from American Eagle for $40 and I'll be happy. Drew, his jeans are how much? <laughs> he embarrassed to tell you. No, they're expensive, but what happens with his jeans, if he tears them, he just mails them back and they send him another pair. <laughs> the jeans are like 200 something dollars. But everything he has is like that. So I'm, I'm already, I've already spoken over him. I've already prophesied over him that you will be rich. You have to be rich with the taste that you have. And it's already begun to manifest because the boy is getting job offers and he's a, he's a junior. He told me the other day, very casually, yeah, they said I could graduate early. I said, what? Yeah, but I don't think I'm going to do it. I'm just going to minor in another. I'm a minor in math, I think. I'm like, ain't no lame stuff going on over here. Ain't no lame, ain't no, look at somebody say, ain't no lame stuff going on over here. Come on, talk about yourself. Come on, even if you was talking lame before, you better start talking something different tonight because you sitting there, Drew. Come on, you, you sitting there, Pastor A. Come on, you sitting over there by Deacon Tony. Come on, you sitting by some folk that refuse to take that kind of label over them. Come on, what if you made up in your mind that you refuse to settle? 
What would happen in your life? Odds might look like they're against you. Come on, Gideon, the odds look against him. And for many of us, when the odds look like they're stacked against us, we run and hide and we give up and we quit. But the word says, be ye not weary in your well-doing. For in due season, you're going to reap if you faint not. And so you got to keep going. Look at somebody say, keep going. Come on, you got to keep going. It's tired, but keep going. Come on, sweating, but keep going. Hand that stuff, keep going. Come on, losing friends, but keep going. Come on, God is with you. Come on, keep going. Don't look like you got the resources, but you got to keep going.
place of worship, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord God, for the word that was given, the word of reproof, Lord God, the word of comfort, the word of guidance, Lord God, the word that lets us know what you are is the majority, Lord Jesus. And through you and by you, we can do all things but fail, Lord God. And we thank you, God, that you cover us with your promises, Lord God, and you fulfill them and you manifest them, Lord Jesus. Lord God, we ask that right now that you pour it back into our pastor, Lord God, everything that she has poured onto us, Lord God, the tutelage of leadership, Lord Jesus, and the word and Bible class tonight, everything that she has poured into this body, Lord God, we ask that you pour back into her body, Lord God. Lord God, we thank you, we praise you, seal everything, Holy Spirit, seal everything, Holy Spirit, even when we leave out, keep and allow the gifts to continually be stirred up within us, Lord Jesus, that we can encourage someone else, Lord God, and that they can get ignited by this fire and this excitement that we have in your word, Lord Jesus. Lord God, these things we ask in your precious and mighty today, and we say amen, amen. And the offering, Lord Jesus, as we give our offering, we ask that you purify and make it meet for the message used, that we can build and do the things that we need to do, Lord Jesus, that we can put a smile on your face, Lord God. God. And we thank you and we praise you for that as well. And we say amen, amen. and amen. Wanna be where you are. Gotta be where you are. Wanna be where you are. Gotta be where you are. Wanna be where we are officially. We, oh, giving our offer first. So thank you, Pastor. Thank you. 